Hey everybody, it's Eric here with Ecotone Explorer. Um, I was behind the camera yesterday. Uh, I'm at an outdoor retailer, Summer Market 2019. And I was behind the camera yesterday and uh, Brad was doing an interview with Kenji and I'm with Brad Wernz from the Boulder Climbing Gym. Is that, did I say that correctly? Yep. Uh, and Brad was talking about uh, you, okay, you have a climbing gym. I have a climbing gym. And one of the opportunities in the climbing gym, of course, is to position or to get people into gear and apparel at the climbing gym. And in doing that, you were able to really start from scratch building your own business model. And you mentioned some stuff about your business model that struck a bell with me because I've been paying a lot of attention to uh, this idea of fulfilled by Amazon and how fulfilled by Amazon fits or what kind of impact it's going to have on the retail landscape. And um, it strikes me that there's potential that if you're starting a new retail shop, you're going to need to integrate FBA or you're going to have to compete with them. If you have an old t retail shop, you're going to have to change how you structure your business or you're going to have to figure out how to survive dealing with the FBA and do something that FBA doesn't compete with. Um, but I'd like to, maybe we could start out first by just, let's talk about a little bit about where you're located, kind of what service you provide to the community you're in, and then how the retail piece came to sort of like how it came to form in that in that setting. Well, we're a, we're a, I mean a climbing gym in any setting is a is a space for community. So our main thing is that we provide community for anyone who wants to be within that community. And the, the cool thing about a climbing gym is because we have so much capacity. Anybody who claims ownership in the community really is the community. So you have your Tuesday night crew and your Thursday night crew. They might not be the same people, but they both believe that. They own the gym, you know, from from a community perspective. So, I like to think of the gym as a great white space for people to come in and engage and paint the colors, you know, their favorite colors. So it's the walls just a that, blank canvas. Just a blank canvas for people to to present uh, who they are within the blank canvas. So they come in and they climb and they make friends. And Eric and Brad go climbing and you know nothing about you know. Kenji and Nabaki, you know, climbing right. somewhere else. Right, They're right. Climbing another time. It's right. just, hey, we're the Thursday night guys, and we, this is, everybody knows us. You know, yeah, yeah. that's what we try to provide. But, um, you know, one of the opportunities in a climbing gym is a pro shop, and my particular gym has always not, pretty much not done a pro shop. And part of the reason for that is when we opened, um, we would have competed with a lot of good climbing stores in town. We'd much rather have them send us people, and we'd send them customers, and it was a lot more collegial that way. But secondly, to, to do a pro shop well, you have to do it really well. And climbing gear, as we know, is just really hard to do well. You, yeah. you know, people are so brand driven. They're so category driven. Uh, stuff doesn't turn well. There's you know, a, a huge amount of skews you have to hold on to. A huge amount of skews. Huge amount of inventory commitment. Um, you know, we were creating a dust collection basically when we tried to do it. You know, if people come in, do you have cams? Oh yeah, we have cams. You show them the cams. You have. Oh, I really wanted the other brand, and they'd walk right out. So yeah, yeah. meanwhile, the cams collect dust. Yeah. You know, until the next person came in. So we're experimenting with different models where um, we work in partnership with some someone who carries everything and uh, we're, have a kiosk interface where people are, you know, we're able to choose from that deep well of inventory, pull from that deep well of inventory. So my guys are just invested in um, giving the customer a good experience. We only sell things that touch the body, shoes, harness, chalk bag, belay device, carabiners for the for uh, belay devices and chalk bags. That's pretty much it. We sell swag for our gym, you know, the branding. Yep. But um, somebody wants a rope, somebody wants cam, somebody wants nuts. Um, you know, the goal is is that they can reach into the machine and get them based on a conversation that our guys might have with them or our people in general would have with them, and, and be, they'll be able to convert on a sale that way. And and um, that comes as a result of um, I think they in the ski hard goods they refer to it as a pre-qualifying the consumer and positioning them in the, you know what type of climbing they're going to do. Yeah, uh, well, I mean because that's the value you're adding is you're sitting down and talking with them. And 
kind of sussing out what they want to accomplish and then trying to give them the, the resources or make inform them as to which resources they want to have available when they go out, right? Yeah, I mean, the thing about these specialty sports, whether it's climbing, skiing, um, golf, tennis, having a baby, having a puppy, you know, you, you, you suddenly are in this position where you've got this puppy in your arms and you run into a pet store and you're like, sell me everything. Yeah. And you're not there for the stuff. You're there for the advice. The stuff is just what you transact with, really. I mean, you have the puppy, it has needs. You go to talk to somebody, what are these puppies' needs? What do I need to take care of this puppy? And that's why they go to specialty stores. And so when they come into the climbing gym, they just want advice on the climbing equipment and what they might need for a particular type of climbing, whether it's top roping or sport climbing or trad climbing or what have you. It may be different, but the advice is really the critical part of that. But unlike a normal climbing store, you've got the experience right there. So after the conversation happens, um, the person can go back and just go on the wall. Yeah, just go right on the wall. So that, that, that's that's, but the climbing stores can't really offer that. I mean, they might have a bouldering problem in their in their store, but you know, like I mean, you go to REI, they've got a great climbing wall, but is it always open? Is it does it always have somebody working at it? You know, like often you're, you're yeah, not you supposed to go up on it. Yeah, you can't. I mean, you can't really try your gear anywhere else. Um, if you're a climber, you can if you're a skier, you can if you're a cyclist, you can demo stuff and take it out on the hill yeah. or take it out on the track. But then you have to participate in a demo day where a retailer who holds inventory has yeah. maybe an expense to come up and, and it's this whole production that goes on. Whereas the climbing gym, that's just Thursday night, 52 weeks a year, mm -hmm. same community, everybody knows where it is, it, weather does, changes, it, it doesn't matter. Right? Yeah, and I mean, it's, that's a huge advantage, but then again, because of the inventory commitment required to do it well, it's a huge disadvantage because it's not our core business. I mean, we, we make money primarily by people coming in, breathing the air, and pulling on our holds. You know, so the, the the pro shop sales are important, but and I don't want to minimize that. But they, the approach to it that we're looking at is a way that any specialty industry could take advantage of um, by basically divorcing themselves from the need to hold inventory. Okay, so that takes us to the next part of the conversation, which is FBA. And so you talk about this long, you know, this deep well of inventory, right? Uh, are you referring to a deeper well of inventory than a normal climbing shop would have? Uh, yeah, actually. I mean, in our space, there's recognized uh, experts, online providers who stock literally everything. and. Um, same in a ski space, same in a golf space. They're all online providers, but they um, they have access to just everything you'd ever need. So, so uh, to give a little credit to Malcolm Gladwell because this got this information from him and came to understand this concept from him. Uh, uh, it's about the long tail. It's about statistical distribution and the long tail of. Uh, of product and, and inventory and how it's infinite and how if you go to uh, a store like Walmart uh, or a big box store, what you're going to see is uh, pretty deep shelves with lots of stuff on them, but not a, a lot of choices. And then you have the other option where if you have access to um, to distribution that doesn't have to be located in the back of the store or doesn't have to you don't have to pay expensive retail you talked about this yesterday expensive retail space where you you're paying a ton of money just to be able to talk to somebody mm -hmm. uh, if that distribution space is handled someplace else then suddenly you have access to that long tail of distribution and in a way you can outcompete big players like Walmart because you you actually are, have the time have the expertise to sit down and talk to somebody more expertise than you would find say in the electronics department at Walmart about like a computer, much deeper uh, passion about the, the actual use of the product. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that long tail distribution? How does that does that add value to your offering? Yeah, it adds significant value, and it just reminds me too of the the way that retailers and consumers both have thought about inventory for a long time has really flipped on its head. Um, because um, it, used, it used to be, we'd go to the outdoor store, the climbing store, 
uh, because we were interested in climbing and we would talk to other climbers. But while we were there, we engaged with brands. Like uh, the first time I encountered the North Face or Patagonia or Marmot or, um, you know, EBs for that matter for climbing shoes or uh, before Black Diamond Shin Art Equipment. I remember those vividly because I was in the storage where they were. Um, where they were stocked, but I went there because they were the climbing stores first. The brands that I became film familiar with, it's not that they weren't relevant, they were just kind of irrelevant, you know, because I went to the climbing store to find climbing equipment and then the brands became more important. But but in a pragmatic way, you went into the climbing store not thinking, I need that North Face jacket. You went into the climbing store saying, I need to stay warm on a climb. Yeah. And then you discovered, hey, you know what, North Face, North Face makes a really good, uh, with that, adder, adder, you know, Makes a good uh, uh, jacket for when you're on blay and you're not, you're you're anaerobic and you're not exercising anymore and um, and you're you're cooling off quickly. Yeah. Um, so so you, you find the brand and then then the stores begin to get um, distributed by the brand. Like we carry the North Face, they carry Patagonia. There used to be those uh, distribution yeah, issues. Yeah. So then the reason you go to a particular store is because they had a particular brand, not because they were a climbing shop and you wanted information. You went there because of the brands. The brands got uh, you know, a finite distribution, or it had a finite distribution, and so you made choices based on going to where you are. But in that case, um, the brand, uh, not the brand, but the products themselves were static. Inventory was static. If I went into a shop and I wanted a blue um, you know, Marmot Gore-Tex jacket, and they didn't have Marmot, and they only had the North Face, and they had it in red in my size, I had a choice. I could either leave and try to find it somewhere else in town, which might be unlikely because there weren't that many of these stores, or I could just pivot and buy the red North Face one instead of the blue Marmot one that I wanted or thought I wanted for whatever reason. But now inventory is liquid, so meaning inventory exists all around us. Inventory exists on our device. So if I walk out of a store not getting the blue marmot jacket that I wanted in my size, I can get it liquid. I can get it right through the device itself right then. And the store is left with the static inventory. They can only carry so much. And so what, what you know, getting back full circle for the long tail of this distribution system is that um, stores through technology, through the deeper wells of inventory, should have the ability to transact on their expertise and on their passion and on their specialty. And inventory should be as liquid to retailers as it is already is to consumers. And right. the consumers go to the retailer so that they um, uh, get the information and then they'll transact right there. Mm -hmm. But right now the transaction is completely divorced from the information. It almost seems like the retailer gets punished for holding the inventory. Absolutely, they get punished. Um, so let's let's pivot again and now let's talk about FBA. Mm -hmm. What are your so FBA? just in case you're new to this and, and haven't heard about this, is the opportunity for just about anybody, anybody who decides they want to brand themselves and put a store together, they can work out a relationship with Amazon where they don't have to hold any inventory, they never ship anything, they never handle a box, they never put tape on a box, none of that ever happens, but they, they assume some of the risk of actually um, marketing and, and, and helping promote the products that they want to sell. In some cases, you actually get the inventory, then send it to Amazon, they hold it. In other cases, you're just using, you're driving consumers to Amazon, and, and that's how the relationship works. Uh, but what seems to me to be almost the natural partner for this business model that you've described it is a, a you know as you said earlier you're either going to have to adopt this business model with FBA or you're going to have to find a way to compete with it and I think right now there are online providers in specific niches that can do it better than Amazon I mean like you, you go climbing on Amazon and the first 20 hits are uh, grappling hooks for instance yeah. you know which climbers don't even use and and so you need the expertise and not to not to diss FBA for that sole reason but there are providers in spaces golf, tennis, right. climbing, that could be the partner as a gateway. And I, I think retailers are going to be more open to that first before they drink the Kool-Aid on the advantages that something like FBA or FBA itself could bring to them. Because it's... Um, it's really threatening, isn't it? It's threatening to, to hand over a good chunk of your business model to Amazon, which has said that they're not a friend to anybody, really. Well, and, and here's, here's my warning. I can see the writing on the wall. As far as I'm concerned, they're the Borg. 
yeah. assimilate or, or destroy. Yeah. And um, and and as far as as far as I can tell, the 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 operating ethos in Amazon is that all retail is is their domain. All retail. And so even though they haven't figured out that they need to be niche in these specialty markets, they haven't done it yet. They might do it next year. They're experimenting again with books and groceries. Those are pretty niche. So it turns out that Amazon's got this thing now where if, uh, with the grocery delivery service, uh, you know, you order one item and you get it recurring every month and you get 5% off of that. But it's already at a lower price than you can find in any retail store. It's at a lower price than you're going to find at the grocery store across the street. I go over to Walmart, it's way lower than I'm going to find at Walmart. And then I go online and I find out, wait a minute, if I up my order to five items and not just that case of monster drink, but I, I get some jam and I get this other thing and it doesn't have to be big, you know, then the whole bill goes down by 15%. I'm still not paying shipping. <laughs> and it still shows up on my doorstep, you know, and they're delivering groceries to my doorstep. I'm disabled. I hate carrying stuff around. Like just shopping's a pain in the butt for me. So if I know I need that, it's a, my, my wife has this phrase, and she uses it all the time, and she uses it when we're in retail. When she sees something and something's not quite clicking for her at the retail, in the retail experience, whether it's getting a jacket or looking at a pair of shoes or whatnot, she will pull out her phone, and within 15 or 20 seconds, she'll say, Amazon wins again. Wow. And she'll say it right in front of the retailer. And then the retailers see the value, the value transaction and how the value that we're being offered from Amazon is much greater than the value that they're offering from us. And there's really nothing they can say. Like, why would they want us to pay more money, you know, to go through that experience? Well, you know, in my case, why would I want to pay more money to have to go to the last aisle at Walmart and deal with Walmart? Yeah. You know, where I can just not even think about it. My doorbell rings, and I just go out and pull the stuff. Well, I, I think you're correct, and we talked about this earlier, too, but I think you're correct in that retailers could pivot that to their advantage. They, you know, and they need to transact. In that case, they need to transact on their knowledge base, their credibility, their passion, you know, their engagement with the community, their knowledge of their customer. And they need, so they need to put themselves in between them and Amazon, between the consumer and Amazon. Yeah, they need to get a back end for their inventory. FBA is one option. Well, there there's are that, but the consumer needs to know, don't go to Amazon for this stuff. Come come here and you get come the here information. Because, because you're not going to find an expert in Amazon who's going to describe this to you. The thing I'm concerned about what you just said about the discount model, though, is, you know, in my mind, that's that discount is uh, our percentage points that they could give to retailers and other partners who would drive sales for them. This is true, but they're trying to kill grocery. Yeah. And this is only in grocery. Yeah, and that's just, that'll be an interesting experiment to watch. They're yeah, going to destroy yeah. grocery too. Yeah. I mean, they, between that and the drone delivery of stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm not even sure I'll recognize the world I live in 10 years from now. Yeah. Honestly, it's just going so fast.